the next video is the next installment for William Carey and we're up to conversions and expansions. There was great jubilation in the Sarah Poor family. They had made their first convert at last. In Sarah Poor they lived a poor carpenter, a Hindu, and Hindus were very hard to bring to Christ. Krishna Pal was his name. Now one day Krishna Pal slipped and dislocated his shoulder. And as Thomas was with the missionary family at the time, he went at once with Carrie and Marshman to see what could be done to help the poor man. Of course, in those days, there was no x-ray, though in, this, in any case, this injury was all too easy to diagnose, and there was no chloroform. Poor Krishna Pal was tied firmly to a tree. Carrie and Marshman held out his arm, and Thomas jerked the bone back into its socket. I am a great sinner, a great sinner am I. Save me, Sahib, save me, yelled the poor sufferer, hardly knowing what he was saying in his agony. But Thomas took what he said seriously and showed himself a good psychologist. He knew that a man in Krishna Powell's condition at that moment could not listen to long and convincing arguments. As he bound the injured shoulder, he simply repeated the same text over and over again, ten times, putting it into an Indian poetic form to help. Krishna Pal, remember it. He that covereth his sh sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth, confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. The Hindu went off home for a few days in bed with a comforted shoulder and some good words in his mind. One day when he was up and bad again, he met Thomas in the street. Sahib, he said, I am a very great sinner, but I have confessed my sin and I am free. This was the first conversion in the history of the Baptist Missionary Society. Every day after that, Krishna Pal came to the mission for teaching, and soon his wife and daughter and his best friend Golak had made up their minds that they too would walk with Jesus. The day of Krishna Pal's baptism was probably the most exciting day Kerry had known since he set foot in India. At last, their first convert was publicly confessing the Lord Jesus Christ as his saviour. And he was a caste man. Krishna Pal and Kerry's first son Felix were both baptized, European Indian and Indian, confessing the same Lord the same day. Golak and the women had taken fright at the last moment, but their turn came later on. There was only one cloud. The excitement and the joy of this event had so upset poor Thomas that he too, like Dorothy, grew mentally ill. And from that time, there was little he could do to help the Serampur mission, even after he had recovered. But he did not live long. God wanted him in heaven where his hopeless business irresponsibility was forgotten. And the only fact in his life which was remembered was his undying love for the Lord who had saved him and his unfailing eagerness to bring others to him. At about the same time that Thomas died, Bronston too fell incurably ill and his death meant that out of the seven missionaries sent out by the Baptist Missionary Society, only three were left. But what a three they were. Soon they came to be known as the Sam Triad, and from this time onward we shall find that Carey's life can hardly be thought of apart from the lives of his two friends. The work was growing on every hand. After three years there were thirteen baptised Bengalis. The schools developed so fast that in October 1801 they had to buy a large house and grounds next door to the one they owned, and within two years the schools alone were making an income of nearly a thousand pounds a year for the mission. In that same year, the Bengali New Testament was completed. Most of it set up by Ward with Felix's help. That was a joyous day when the first bound copy was taken into the little chapel and laid on the communion table. An all mission family and the baptized converts met together for glad thanksgiving. The missionaries by now were going out in pairs farther afield among the villages, taking scriptures and tracts and preaching wherever they could. Sometimes they would take converts with them, and Krishna Pal went with Ward on his very first tour. But William Carey was not only set upon doing positive good, he was set against positive evil. And there were terrible evils in India. There was, for one thing, nothing less than open baby murder. Every January at the full moon there was a great Hindu festival, held by the river Ganges empties into the sea. One of the ways in which devoted Hindu mothers showed their religious devotion was to throw their babies into the sacred river where they drowned or experienced the tender mercies of crocodiles or sharks. 
The British government did not wish to upset the native religious customs, so they did nothing. But Mr. Udney, the indigo planter, was a good Christian man, and at last he was able to bring the matter before Lord Wellesley. When Wellesley agreed to a formal inquiry, Udney suggested William Carey as the best man for the job, and the government general, Governor General agreed. Carey was more than willing. Never had he forgotten a little dead baby he and Thomas had found cast out from its home because the family thought it was bewitched, as it was sick and feeble. Carey's report to the government was a fiery report and an ineffective one. A new law was made, and the very next year at the festival, Indian soldiers were stationed along the banks of the river to see that new law was obeyed, and from that time onward, baby sacrifice became a thing of the past. Another evil was not so easily stamped out. Hindus burn the bodies of their dead. Not a bad practice in a very hot climate, some people think. But there was another terrible custom. The widow of a dead man was allowed, more she was expected, to submit to being burned alive on her husband's funeral pyre. Sate, the Indians called it. The curry never forgot the one time he saw a sati. The only thing which kept him on the spot was his agonised hope that he could put a stop to it. With all his power, all his words, he tried to persuade that poor misguided woman to give up her determination to induce the heartless onlookers to intervene. But that time he failed. Still it nerved him as nothing else could to set himself against the evil. Soon he was chosen to make an official investigation of that subject. He employed a number of reliable Indians and sent them to discover and report on all the burnings in a certain area around Calcutta. They heard of 400 and working on that figure, they reckoned that in the provinces of Bengal, 10,000 people went to this death every year. This report of Kerry's also went to the authorities, and although it was 25 years before something was done, the atrocity was at least at last stamped out. It was a Saturday, Sunday morning, and he sat in his study busy on his sermon when a courier from the Governor-General Governor arrived with an urgent dispatch which Kerry was asked to translate into Bengali immediately. Kerry frowned. Was the Lord's Day the day for translating government documents? But one glance of the paper swept the frown away. He leapt to his feet, threw off his best Sunday coat and sent to work. The document was an edict abolishing sati throughout the British dominions in India. Someone was sent to find one of the others to take the Sunday service, and I dare say that few other documents have been translated so quickly. If I delay a moment to translate and publish this edict, Carey thought, who knows how many widows' lives may be lost. And the edict was published and put into effect in double-quick time. And that ends that instalment for William Carey.